hate to be the one to break it to you, but sex education of the past failed us. Because birds and bees, they don't fuck. Welcome to Birds and Bees Don't Fuck, a podcast where we learn exactly how bad our formative sex education, or lack thereof, really was. I'm your host, Arielle Zadok. I'm an intimacy coordinator, producer, and sexologist. My guest today is a comedian, actress, and writer. Welcome to the show, Christine Medrano. Hello. Thank you for having me. Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, I love the concept of this entire podcast, by the way. Um, (laughs) It's so great. Also, I totally forgot to tell you that I was once in a sex ed video you were oh my god <laughs> okay wait <laughs> wait <laughs> okay you're the first guest that is like by the way <laughs> by the way i've educated america's youth oh my goodness okay so we got a comedian <laughs> sex educator crossover right here right now folks like wow okay please tell me everything from the start <laughs> it was like truly like one of my i think one of my first acting gigs and it was like um as i got i was playing this girl who gets um warts on the back of her throat from giving a blow job and she goes like well she goes to a clinic she's like well sex i didn't really have sex and they're like you can still get an std without having penetrative sex i'm like oral sex is not sex oh um, my god but it is it is it is <laughs> yeah and that is why we're all fucked <laughs> yeah 100 percent. so <laughs> oh my god it's called truth it's called like straight talk the truth about stds oh Oh my god do you have a copy of that I, I i feel like i don't i feel like i have a tiny clip of it from like on my instagram from years ago yeah. where there's like a like it's like me and a, a fake nurse oh my god giving me the bad news that i i got an std from giving a blow job oh boy <laughs> i love that so much but it's also like a really valid point because so many people don't think about passing STIs, which we do call them STIs now, mm-hmm. not STDs. Back in the day, we did. Although overseas, they kind of always used STIs because it yeah. made more sense. Um, so yeah, we, we often are not thinking about oral. Be- like you can get and give chlamydia through oral. You can get and give gonorrhea through oral. Like all of these things can be passed through that because we're talking about membranes. Yeah. Much so like my character. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> See, I mean, there was some important stuff in there even if they uh called oral not sex but it is yeah or like my character my character does. your character and then the nurse corrects her puts her in her place be like hey actually wrong oral sex is sex yeah, yeah. okay so we do love that we yeah. do love the course correcting when how long ago is this oh boy that was that was long ago yeah. i, I want to say that's like more than like it's maybe like 10 years ago something oh, wow. like that yeah oh my gosh what a wild ride so many questions yeah so many questions. <laughs> what was the production like the production was like really it was like not non-union believe it or of not of course it was non-union um, and i feel like i just all i remember is that they had me one day coming in and they told me it was gonna be voiceover and i didn't know it was gonna be like straight to camera documentary being like living with an std has been hard ah. but and then i had to give like some sort of confessional and then they didn't tell me that i was gonna be on camera so i came with my hair wet and curly and then they got mad all that's all i remember but oh it was God. like really it was really low-key we were like in a clinic um it was filmed like a documentary and i remember the editor told the filmmaker that he thought like we were all like kids who actually got in oh my god so it was like <laughs> office of style yeah kind of it was straight well it was like yeah honestly i feel like that could be a really funny show to have like an office but it's an sti clinic an sti clinic and you're like oh here we go again do you want to show run a show with me i know right <laughs> you heard it here first folks uh that would be that would be pretty funny, though. Yeah, absolutely. People also get stuff stuck up their butts all the time. Oh, I'm sure. I'm uh, up their butts, up every orifice, you know? It's still one of the top reasons why people go to the emergency room. Really? Yes, because not enough people know that your butt is a vacuum, and it will <laughs> suck up the sphincter. She's strong, and she wants to take it all in. You put this pen up there, it's gone. Gone. What, do you, what do you think the thing that they find the most out of people are pens sharpies yeah, yeah. Okay. i think actually i did re- i mean i in fact checked me on that one <laughs> but i believe at some point i did uh 
learn that like a lot of times it was things like pens or just because they're small. So yeah. if you do want to explore anal play, like you got to start small, like literally start with your pinky because it's not something that your body is used to receiving. And yeah. it's not, it doesn't work the same way that a vagina does where a vagina will literally open up for you once it's aroused. Yeah. Like it expands uh, outwards and upwards. Your ass ain't doing that. So you need a lot of lube and you got to go slow and you have to be as relaxed as possible because when you're not relaxed, the sphincter is again, like it's in protection mode. So it's going to like suck it up and close up and all that. But if you're relaxed, then it's a little bit more malleable and whatever, but still this thing is going up there. Like you need to have a stopper on anything you're going to put up your butt. That's the PSA of the day. I wonder, like, are they are they doing it like alone? Are they with people, and that's why it's kind of like, whoa, 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 what's going on? You know what I mean? <laughs> um, like, I'm just, yeah, yeah. So I think it's mostly people by themselves. Oh, okay. yeah, exploring by themselves. But you know, I'm sure it's it with happens. partners as well. Ruby, your butt is in the way. Speaking of butts, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's uh, it, p- p- again, like, it comes to a lack of sex education, and because especially with men, there's like this whole bullshit storyline that like, if you like something up your butt, then you're gay. Like that has nothing to do with your sexuality just because you like something in your ass, which by the way, is like a portal to your, uh, to your prostate. So like, it's the only way you can get there. It doesn't mean that you like men (laughs) or dicks or anything. I do like they use the word portal. Um, (laughs) (laughs) It's like unlocking a universe. It is. Listen, yeah. the orgasms you can get through an asshole does unlock a universe. <laughs> I just think because like I have such I I'm one of those people who have such like bad. I mean, you're not only but bad sex education. You know yeah. what I mean? Just like truly. I'm, well, because all of us do. That's like yeah. the whole point of this is like let's talk about how fucked up it all was. So wait, where did you grow up? Um, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Ooh! We got a Canadian. Yeah. I, oh, man. Canada. And I went to 14 years of Catholic school. <gasps> so as you can imagine. <laughs> she heard buttholes. She heard buttholes. She's like, <laughs> she's like you she's called like, for a portal? Ass up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, okay. Catholic and Canadian. Catholic and Canadian. I feel like perhaps they were really nice about the way that they shamed you. <laughs> I mean, they made us watch a video about abortions when we were 14. Wow. But then we never got a proper sex ad. <laughs> wow. So, okay. Questions. Did they teach you anything about like periods or wet dreams? Like, did you separate rooms? Do you remember no. anything? Honestly, Literally just abortion? When when I when I was growing up, because I got my period pretty early, I thought I was shitting my pants. Oh no. Because <laughs> it was just it's and brown. This is, because it's brown. Yeah, so yeah. I was just like, and so I was hiding my underwear and my mom found them and she was like, hey. And she, I thought I was in trouble for Aww. like shitting my pants. Oh no! <laughs> um, but she's like, "You can have a baby now." And I was like, huh? You're like "What? I don't oh, want. I don't. I, don't want I am a baby. A baby. I, I yeah, exactly. What do you mean I can have a baby? But yeah, there's no real talk at my school. It was literally when we were 18, they put us in a room with a nun, and they were like, "You can ask questions," but she didn't. Like, this bitch ain't fucking. Yeah. <laughs> You can ask questions. You can ask questions. Has she was, even seen her vulva? Bet not. Uh, probably not. She Bet probably not. doesn't know any of the stuff downtown. Mm-hmm. <laughs> stuff downtown. Um, <laughs> the downtown. Yeah. <laughs> they truly just put us in a room with a nun and then they were like, ask questions, but she couldn't tell us anything because also Catholics don't, yeah. they can only preach abstinence, right? Wow. And they don't have any birth control or whatever. So, and ever, and the questions were horrible, of course. We're like, we're like, what's a pap smear? And she talked about the pap smear for about like half an hour. And then someone was like, how long does this take? She was like, oh, like five minutes. We're like, why did we waste half of our time on this? Yeah. And then someone asked about getting pregnant in a jacuzzi. Oh, yeah. That's a question that comes up. A classic. And I think that like was it. Wow. But she wouldn't have been equipped to answer anything anyway. A hundred percent not. She was like 80 years old, oh all white hair, like truly, like imagine, you know what I mean? Like she, I don't, I think, I'm pretty sure she was a virgin or a closeted oh, yeah. woman. <laughs> That's I, I imagine oh, most nuns are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I can't believe they showed you a video on abortion yeah, at 14. I, yeah. I just remember all, like it was about like, 
you know how many regrets these women have had and things like that so i feel like we all we got the we really got like the shame part of it mm. and none of the education part of it of like what's actually happening and no. what like yeah and also the vast majority of people who have had abortions are very happy with that decision and absolutely oh. do not regret it. I am one of them. Hell it's yeah. Like, that was the best thing that I've ever done for myself and for that potential human being. Like, yeah. it's, yeah, it's, an, it's a non regrettable decision. <laughs> it's a hard decision. Like, either way, like, yeah. it's a shitty thing to have to do, but it happens. Like, yeah. whatever. And what are you going to do? You fucking take care of it instead of creating a human that is going to have a terrible life. Yeah. And then ha you have a terrible life. And then, and then you your family also has a terrible life. Like, it's fucked up. It's yeah. Terrible. It's horrible to push that on women, you know? Mm. Um, but yeah, that was all we got. Like, truly, I feel like even now as an adult, I'm like, I'm like, there's two holes down there. Like, truly, yeah. I didn't know how to put in a tampon correctly until I was like in my 20s. Oh my God. Like, that, you know, like that is bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, and I remember like looking at uh, the instructions on yeah. tampons because my mom was like, oh, you can't use a tampon yet. Like, you're too, you're too young for that type yeah. shit, which yeah. was like, <laughs> what no i'm not like yeah. honey i've been sticking things up there <laughs> like pens no i don't think i ever used a pen but i would do, try like brushes and like yeah. be like i don't know what's going on up there yeah um so yeah i remember looking at like the instructions for how to put a tampon in where like they cut oh, off the side God, yeah. body <laughs> <laughs> and like they show they show her from like that like, angle it's such a weird angle and like they show her like opening up her vulva but like not but it's like it's yeah it's weird this is how bad i was at putting in tampons for a while i would put them in with the applicator and i didn't understand i was like how do women just walk around like this i'm yeah. in pain how does this happen I'm in pain. all day yeah oh my god like truly just like uninformed like that's bad yeah <laughs> listen that's i mean that's what everyone is left with like everyone is truly left to their own devices or to like ask other children yeah. about things which is like it's so fucked up when you really think about it because the adults in the room Aren't were so filled with shame and guilt and their own misunderstanding about the bodies that like then we're expecting them to teach children, but they don't even know this shit themselves. They don't understand it. And also half of them are just there because they're getting overtime. Yeah. <laughs> or like they're being forced to do or it. they're forced to do it. They're like, oh boy, God, I got to teach sex ed. Yeah. Of that episode of um, King of the Hill where it's Peggy has to do it. She can't even say penis. She oh my God. Like, happiness. Oh, happiness. I do remember that. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. There's, uh, that's why I love Big Mouth. I love that show. Because it's all the teenagers and like, have you ever seen Big I've Mouth? I only watched like one or two episodes. Oh, I, I really have not like it. gotten into it yet. Yeah, it's oh. really fun. They cover a lot of topics and things that you experience as you're going through puberty yeah. in really fun ways. And they have like these hormone monsters. <laughs> and then they did an offshoot show <gasps> that's just like the hormone monsters and they're like HR. Oh, that's so fun. <laughs> so it's like the office, but it's all the hormone monsters and they're just like having their coffee. And like, it's fucking hilarious. It's so funny. Like I, I, I mean, obviously I love edutainment, but it's just like, we got to be able to make fun of the shit that we don't know because yeah. we, like literally we were all fucked. So let's figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And that's so much better than just like going like blind. And it was like, I feel like even with the tempo thing, I feel like I was just like too embarrassed totally. to ask people, you know what I mean? It's just like, oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't until I became a health coach and I was like really starting to get into that world that I even learned that. It's really, I mean, not that I always use organic tampons, but if I use tampons, I try to. Yeah. Uh, because the the little hairs are often left behind in your vagina. Ah. ah. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. So that's why, um, and they're they're like microscopic sometimes, but you yeah. know, like sometimes you'll use a tampon and like you're you're not bleeding that much, so it's a little dry up there, and so you put it in first of all, and it can be kind of rough. So also like. Maybe use a little lube. I don't know. Yeah. I've never actually tried that, but I have thought about it. Um, <laughs> but uh, when you take it out, if you're not really bleeding that much or if you take it out too early, then it's dry. And so then like those teeny tiny little hairs get – they just get left behind and they're just like, mm, parting gift. Uh, oh. So – 
Well, it is kind of important to use organic tampons yeah. if you can, because then at least the shit that's getting left behind is of a better quality for your body. Yeah. So. Like just leaving plastics up there. Yeah. You know, you're just, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Dumping stuff. Dumping stuff. Yeah. But that, you know, like that was probably 10 years ago that I learned that, but like, who's talking about that? I'm talking about it now. So yeah. whoever's listening is now going to be aware of that. So like, you're welcome. Um, but that was like, oh, I didn't even think about that because we Not don't think all. about that. No, I'm just kind of like, all right, got to put it, stop, you know, got to plug it up. <laughs> plug it in, plug, plug it, it in. Up. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I, I would never even think, well, I guess there's some stuff being left behind. I would just be like, thank God that's out of me. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, because it was always like TSS, like tox <laughs> toxic shock syndrome. That's the thing, right? Which yeah. is the thing, but like, I don't think it happens that often. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I've never heard of an actual story of that. I'm not saying that it's a myth or a lie. Like, it does happen. I remember there was some, like, model or something and her story went viral. Oh. She had to get her, like, leg amputated or something. Wow. But I don't know the details of the toxic shock Feel thing like, that happened. Yeah. I mean, but listen, sometimes people, like, forget the tampons are up there. Like, yeah. Which is that there's a whole other thing to be said about mindfulness and mm -hmm. like being aware of your body. And I feel like I didn't really get to know myself and my cycle and my period until I got off of birth control. And then I was like, oh, this is what it's like. Oh, this is what ovulating was like. I remember yeah. the first time that I ovulated and I was like, look at that. Look <laughs> at this little, like, this is obvious. I'm obviously ovulating because I got a big glob of, you know, <laughs> fucking egg yolk up in here. Uh, and now I can feel it every time, but it wasn't wow. until I got off of birth control that I actually was like, oh, now I, I know what's going on here and I know what's going on here and I know what my discharge is like at this yeah. cycle. And like, I know where I'm at in my body. So like, and not everyone can get off birth control and no shame, no shade yeah. or anything like that. But the more we can kind of like get in tune with what the fuck is happening, the more you can be like, oh, yeah, I still got a tampon up there. <laughs> yeah. Or like, I put it in it was an applicator. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've been kind of like I think I was on birth control for like a hot second. When I was like 21. And then it just made me. Like kind of like I had, I feel like I got every single symptom, you know, and I was like yeah. so depressed. I'm like, this is not worth it. And then I got, I feel I've not been on, I mean, I had an IUD for a hot second, but when I, they put it in me, they were literally, they looked at my face and they're like, we can take it out if you need. Cause I guess my face must've gone yeah. white. Yeah. It's like, I didn't know true pain until I had my IUD put in. Mm. And um, I was like in bed for like three days. I feel like the pain was so bad. And I ended up taking it out because like I have pretty light periods. Um, and so I'm like, so I'm just spotting every day. I'm like, this is worse than like a period. You know what I mean? Yeah. What are we doing yeah, here? Exactly. Yeah. And they, that is, I'm so happy that you brought that up because that is something that we really don't talk about enough. And people oh are God. only like yeah. marginally becoming aware of how extraordinarily painful it is to put basically like a little bow and arrow. You're, you're putting that up through your cervix that is not dilated. Your cervix yeah. does open. Obviously a baby comes out of there, but we're, we're shoving these things up our bodies in an unaroused state. <laughs> the least aroused. With, like the yeah. least aroused state in a, a sterile room with bad lights with doctors and nurses who are just like shoving it up there, trying to just like do it quickly, not talking about oh God, the yeah. immense amount of pain that it is. And the fact that like you can get sick for days afterwards. Oh yeah. This should absolutely be done under anesthetic at a minimum. Oh at a yeah. minimum. Like use drugs to open up the cervix because those things exist, like help us dilate help us like get calmed down, like muscle relaxers, like all of the things, give all of the things. Cause it is extraordinarily painful. Oh yeah. And that's not even taking it out. That's just getting the fucker in. Getting it in. And I, you know, I had never really had bad periods, like cramp stuff before, but after that mm -hmm. I was like, this is what like all of my friends who've to talk about being like doubled over in yeah. the bathroom from their, their, their cramps with their periods or talking about, you know, and it was the first time I ever experienced it was because of, 
an IUD and I was definitely like yeah. I wish I'd yeah I wish I'd known that before I did had no idea yeah I was just like oh you just put it in and you're fine and then you're yeah, fine because yeah. they don't talk about don't, it no and listen for some that, people yeah. it's great and they love it and that's great I mean that's why all, all yeah. of us have such different bodies and such different needs like I I was on hormonal birth control I tried every single one of them and they all fucking sucked like yeah. all of the the um pills and hated them all I never tried the patch or the shot because I didn't want to fuck with my body that much I yeah. was like that's too much like like, this is a naturally occurring thing in my body. I don't need to fuck it up that much just because I'm trying not to get pregnant. Yeah. Um, and so then uh, I did have an IUD as well. And that was like nonstop pain for like, I think I had it in for like a year or two. And I was just in pain the whole fucking oh time. God. And then I was like, I, no, like. I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. The copper, yeah. The, the hormonal you said or the copper? No, I didn't do the hormonal because of my experience with oh, like, because gotcha. I was on birth, birth control. control for 10 years and get this, I was allergic to alcohol for all of that time. And it wasn't until like, I went to gastroenterologist. Yeah. I went to specialists. I was trying to like, cause I was 20. This is when I was, it's, I was on birth control when I was 16 um, the allergy to alcohol started when I was 18, probably because I started drinking more. So yeah. it was in my system more. Um, but it was like, I would have a sip of anything and like my jaw would lock up. Like it was, I would throw up every oh single God. time. If it was one sip or three, four, 10 drinks, I would throw up every single time. Didn't matter. <laughs> Rough time to be in college. Oh my gosh. And so yeah. I, I got off of birth control at 25 and then all of a sudden like I could have a drink and I was fine. I was like, that's weird. And then I went back on for a hot stint and then I was like, my body's fucked up. I don't want to do this. So all of the specialists, because I started going to specialists when I was 22 to figure it out and like, bless my parents. They were yeah. trying to help me, Aww. even though like they don't drink alcohol and they definitely did not support their daughter, like being a little <laughs> drunk. But like, obviously, like there was something you should wrong. know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, so thank you know, they're great. They supported me in that. Um, but no, like I had cameras and shit in my body and no one could figure out what it was. I went to an urgent care for a fucking sinus infection. The doctor was a woman. She asked me about allergies and I was like, no, but like I did have this one weird thing with alcohol, blah, blah, blah. Her first question was, were you on birth control? And I said, yeah, actually. And I'm not anymore. And I think it's fine now. And she's like, yeah, that's because they both work through your liver and your liver is not strong enough to process the birth control and the alcohol. So oh it rejected the alcohol. Are you fucking kidding me? I truly had, have never heard of this. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that was a thing that could happen to people that you could just have an allergy to alcohol. I mean, that just tells you how much like bandwidth the, the liver is taking for birth control. And right? it's like, that's, pretty a wild thing to have to put on so many women yes you know yeah. and, and granted like yeah like well, a lot of women do need it for you know it helps with their peers and cramps or mm -hmm. cysts or, or but that's that's crazy it's fucking wild that's, right and it was like all of the other specialists that I was going to they were all, all men. men yeah no one thought to ask me about birth control because they probably didn't know but that just goes to show how fucked up our healthcare system, because everything is through the lens of a man. Yes. Yeah. Literally everything. <sighs> I mean, look at the look at the clitoris and how it was it was discovered and then shadowed and discovered and shadowed. And it wasn't until the 90s. Uh, I wish I could remember her name, but it was uh, a female doctor from Australia that she started. She did the first MRI of a clitoris, and that was the first time that it was legitimately researched because it didn't play any role for men. <laughs> there was no reason for them to like there was no reason for them to investigate that. That is so crazy. Fucked. That just goes to show how much they do not give a fuck if women come or not. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Because the vagina was, that's, you know, that's why we call it a vagina, right? Like the yeah. vagina is the only part of the body that they actually needed for their own pleasure and for where the babies come out. Yeah. So the entirety of the vulva, all of the external body parts didn't fucking matter. That's why we never referred to it as a vulva, only the vagina, because that's the part that mattered. Even the G-spot is named after the guy who discovered it. <laughs> <laughs> so don't call it a fucking G-spot. No. Yeah. Although the I think the other name for it is the urethral sponge. Is it the urethral sponge? No, it's a different name. I forget. It's a terrible name. So <laughs> See, and it? even like all this, I'm kind of like, oh, yes, of course. But I'm like, I don't know because I – I mean, I should probably take it upon myself at this point to look it up. Yeah, but yeah. But just kind of, you know what I mean? I, like just truly with no foundation, you kind of just like, all right. Yeah, it's super yeah. overwhelming. Yeah. It's super overwhelming because 
like we all know that we don't know stuff, right? Like we all know we never, we were never educated. All of the adults in our life for the most part had shame. Although I do know some people that like their adults were like way too open and that wasn't good (laughs) for them either. Um, But you know, like the adults in the room didn't know how to deal with it themselves. And then they're the ones that are teaching us. And we're kind of like our generation and my, my sister is 13 years older than Mm -hmm. me. So like her generation maybe started to scratch the surface a little bit more because they were the first kids of like the boomers and she's Gen X. So like started to, so she, when she was raising her kids, she was like, look at your vulva, go masturbate, touch yourself, play with yourself. This is your body. If you are, she has a son and two daughters. If you're with a woman, like this is how you need to work with her body. Like you, you need to focus on this part. This is how she's going to feel good. If like with her daughters, it's like, this is what feels good to you. Like explore that. If they would be stressed or for something, they, she'd be like, go in your room and masturbate. You're going to feel better. Like you need to <laughs> yeah. release some of this stress. So go figure it out. You know, like, and her kids are very sexually responsible. They know what's coming out of their bodies. They're very respectful to their partners. They like, they, they were never like her son was never like, oh my God, boobs, because yeah. he had exposure and like his friends would be like, oh my God, ah, boobs. And he's like, the fuck is a big deal it's fucking boobs who cares like okay you know i'm always convinced that like beetle mania just didn't like all the mania from like 13 year old girls is because they don't know how to masturbate so like yeah (gasps) like beetle mania twilight justin bieber is all of that mania is built up because young girls don't know to masturbate so they're just like (gasps) clawing at their faces it's inside of me and i don't know what to do with it (laughs) Like literally so much of pop culture is just because young girls don't know how to come. Yeah. I always think about that. I'm I like, love that. Oh, wild. I mean, why? Yeah. It's like. Pent up aggression. It's, yeah. It's pent, pent up aggression and, and energy. And it's like, I got, I have to get this energy out somewhere. And it was for us growing up, like it was so stigmatized to oh, even 100%. think about girls. Like t- it's like, ew, you masturbate. But like dudes are like all the time. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'm, Especially going up, like going to an all-girls school, I feel like there was so oh, much, wow. like, um, like for, in my high school years was uh, four years of Catholic school was uh, all was, was that that was the all-girls portion, just uh, high school, and I feel like um, it just kind of like skewed every like, especially at the time. I feel like I was a virgin until I was twenty-one, but a lot of my friends were a lot more like, you know, they were exploring. Um, but I feel like it was always through like the lens of like what a man wanted. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. All, all the time. Yeah. It's really interesting. So I found this box of notes that we used to pass around in class that was like in my parents' garage for years. And they, they recently <laughs> moved or like a year ago they moved. So like, they're like, get your shit out of our house. Yeah. Cause we don't have a house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well they do just in a different location and a lot smaller. So they sent me this box of stuff and I was reading through it like a week or two ago. And first of all, like, so this is all notes that were being passed between like 13, 14, 15, 12 year old girls. Like, you know, that, so like very boy obsessed. Yeah. hundred percent. Let me just tell you every single one of these notes was like boy obsessed or like what's going on with this friend or blah, 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 blah. (laughs) So like super interesting just to like dig into there. I was also in a very abusive relationship with a best friend. So like that was really interesting to like find those notes. And some of those were like some of my good friends that were like, please remove yourself from that situation. You can't see what's happening, but every, it was like, it was fucking wild. That's heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. It was real fucked up. And I'm like, "Mm." I should maybe think about that a little bit more. But anyway, (laughs) um, part of those stories were like, uh, there were some sexual experiences that were shared in those, which were really interesting. And there was one that I think encompasses how all of us grew up where it was like this older boy, I think she was like 13 and he was like 19 or 16 or something. Like it was, it was like, he was driving a car and she was a literal child. Yeah. And so, um, he like did this move where he like took off his sweatshirt or like maybe it was something, it was something manipulative that like manipulated her to be close enough to him to kiss her, which was just like, yeah, 
that's how it happened. Yeah. Like so much of our formative sexual experiences in the the 90s and like earlier than that too, 80s, 90s, whatever, and throughout all of time <laughs> was how do I manipulate this woman into being close enough that I can touch her body oh, or yeah. that I can kiss her face or whatever? Coercion, 100%. Yeah. 100% coercion. And then like it wound up that I think she did like have sex with this boy or something and then she was like sneaking around. It was like yeah. wild. Like I gotta, I have to, I have to find that note and dig it out again. I should just like read it on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, even looking back at a lot of my relationships or like just like friends I had when I was in high school, I was in a band. And so we would hang out. We had this guy who was, we were probably like 15 and 16 at the time. And there was this band, it was like a bigger band. And this guy, Dave Z, he was like, I'll drum for you guys. He's probably in his 20s. Fucking drummers, man. Watch out for the drummers. And so, and I remember like, he also wanted me to like drop out of school and like go on tour (gasps) with his band. My mom was like, no, you're not doing that. But we'd be like in like, in his van going to like a rehearsal space nothing ever happened to anyone in the band but we later found out that he was like a pedophile that he would like go and he'd like use his position within like the scene yeah to take advantage of girls or even like i think about like we'd be hanging out with like 26 year old dudes being like we're cool we're hanging yeah. with these guys oh, yeah it's like no i mean i don't think any of my the any of the girls in the band that I was in were affected or like you know got abused but it's weird to know that like we were just it was so normalized to yeah. be hanging around with a bunch of like 25 26 year old guys when you're 16 years old not horrible cool. yeah. yeah I feel yeah. like now it's like that would never fly I feel like no. you know what I mean yeah no because now we know better also yeah. you know it is really interesting I think I'm sure I've shared this story in the podcast before but the first penetrative sex that I had was with somebody who was 21 when I was 16 and so yeah. like we both worked at camp together and we like started hooking up over the summer or whatever I'm sure I probably pursued him because I know myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like there, were, there was no, like in in my memory and how I felt and how I remember feeling, like there was no coercion. We had yeah. penetrative sex because I wanted to. And I was like, yeah, man, I want to do this. Like, because I have always been more along the lines of like, I want to know what this experience is. Like yeah. I'm, it's, it's never been this like, oh my God, we have to be in love and it's going to be this dreamy romantic. Like it was never like that for me. It was just like, well, this is the thing I want to try. And yeah. you seem like you're good. <laughs> <laughs> you seem like a fine fellow. <laughs> but see, I feel like so many people are not like evolved enough to think like that. Cause even when I was growing up, I was like, I guess I have to be in love or whatever. Yeah. And I don't think that like, I wish I had, viewed things like more through that lens and being like I have to fall fall in love or whatever because I you know I I, like waited till I was 21 and in love but not really yeah you know what I mean yeah and then you're like I guess this is my boyfriend now because we slept together um yeah and you get like shitty relationships that way I think yeah and I think people still do that yeah 100 it's like yeah you know we I think we put Listen, it's all on on everybody individually to decide what's yeah. right for you and you do not have to have sex with anyone ever. Uh and and the timelines of it is all bullshit. Like yeah. if you don't have penetrative sex uh, until you're 26 or 35 for the first time, like who cares? That's your journey. Yeah. Like it's fine. It's what you want to do. It's your body. You get to decide that. But I think that there's also so much pressure around like wait three dates and do this and if you give it up to like no no have sex when you want to have sex if it's the same night you meet great if you are like I just don't want to be penetrated by this person yet great or I just don't want to penetrate this person yet great doesn't fucking matter none of that matters it's all about when you want to have that experience with that specific person. Yeah. When you're comfortable. Yeah. hundred percent. You know, like there's the rules are such bullshit. And I think that there are a lot of people that like, especially women that are dating men, like they want to have sex sooner, but then they're like, I'm going to be seen as this and I'm going to be like, yeah. Okay. But also there are people who wait a long time to have sex with someone and they date for like a month or two and they like really like this person. And then they find out they're not sexually compatible. Yeah. And it's a fucking problem. And that's sometimes worse. It is. Because then you're like have to mourn this relationship that you kind of like built up in your head rather than just kind of like figuring it out earlier on. Yeah. And then you're also like, am I a bad person? 
for wanting to break up with this person because we don't have sexual chemistry. And that is a question that has come to me often. And it's like, no, you're, you're not a bad person. This is an important part of compatibility when you're looking at partnership. A hundred percent. And uh, I think too many people want to shove that aside, but that's because again, like the way that we all grew up with no sex education and like sex is dirty or sex is this or sex is that instead of just being like, this is a part of your life and your yeah. relationship. If this is what you want in your life and in your relationship, cause not everybody does. So like treat it like you do everything else, your yeah. mental compatibility, your emotional compatibility, like all of that stuff, your sexual compatibility is just as important. So like, don't wait if you don't want to. Yeah. I feel like a, it's interesting though, because I feel like right now, because you're saying that like Gen Z or not Gen Z, Gen Alpha, mm. right? Oh, or something. babies right now. Yeah. The, the, or yeah, like, the is it, or, or is like, it, is it Gen Z who are like not having, like they're not yeah, interested in Z. sex. Yeah. They don't even want to see it in movies. Um, and I'm like, that's so interesting that we're having kind of this, like, I guess not puritanical, but um, this like movement towards like um, being more modest or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, she was all the resources available. I feel like yeah. if I knew had the resources that Gen Z has now, it would completely change how I viewed everything. You know, I also mm -hmm. think I grew up in like a very like comp het um, like compulsory heterosexuality like I'm I'm mm. queer but I didn't realize till later because I feel like I was like well I'm bi but I'm like if I can be attracted to a man then I'm just straight right right yeah yeah, yeah. well I mean and we see that in bi marriages and relationships yeah. all the time if you are married or in a relationship with somebody who is the opposite sex or gender than you then all of a sudden it doesn't make you buy like, yeah. no, I, what, so what, if I'm in a relationship with someone as a straight person, then I'm no longer attracted to any other people of the opposite gender than me. And that's what that doesn't, that, well, it doesn't happen in straight couples. So why would that happen for a bi person? Like yeah. that doesn't make any fucking sense. Yeah. Like you can be gay and have never kissed a person. You yep. can be bi and have never kissed a person. Mm -hmm. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? You don't have to be um like validated by your experiences if it's like how you or like what your preferences are hundred thousand percent you do not have to have the experience to identify that as your sexuality that's why most moms are probably bi most of our moms are probably bi yeah. um and they're probably yeah. not having enough orgasms i gotta be honest with you i have an entire joke about how i my grandma no one's ever gone down on my grandma <laughs> oh. i assume i assume but also like i think about like how yeah how our grandma is probably never uh, like came. really orgasm yeah. that much yeah i mean some of them did but for the most part probably not probably you know? not but here's the thing also like we have this tendency to think that like oral is new and anal is new yeah. and sex toys are new but we had sex toys in ancient history there yeah. are ancient <laughs> literal ancient dildos <laughs> As they're <laughs> <laughs> both on living humans and in toys. Um, but yeah, like it is like, I'm sure my parents were doing all the shit. Like, I don't think that they've done it in a long time, but like when they were young and hot and sexy, like I hope they were doing all the things. I hope they're still doing it now. They're not, but you know, maybe I'll just like slowly start sending them sex toys. <laughs> It'd just be like I like have no name. They just show up at their house. Or they like, would absolutely know it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have to have my dad. So um, this is going to be after Hollywood Burlesque Festival, but I'm going to be broadcasting live from the Hollywood Burlesque Festival, oh, fun. which is going to be super fun. We're just going to be in like the vendor space and and interviewing different people. And, and so it, it's going to air after this one does. Um, but my dad does like big signage and stuff. So Ooh. he's going to make me a sign. <laughs> and I'm like, well, this is, this is going to be the first time that he's, I mean, they have seen like my intimacy coordinating website before and they know about this podcast and they know, you know, it's taken them a long time to like, he has always been super duper supportive. My dad is the best. He, yeah. like I always say, my daddy issue is that my daddy loved me too much. <laughs> <laughs> That's my daddy issue. He fucking loves me. Um, but they've, 
so he's always been like more chill with all this stuff. Yeah. My mom who grew up Catholic and converted to Judaism is like super uncomfortable. She's gotten better over the years, but Aww. like it's taken years, but I'm like, Oh, this is the first time he's going to like really be confronted with like some of the copy. <laughs> That's so funny. But I think it's like, it's, it's a way to like connect with him in a weird way. Right. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like know exactly what you're doing or like, you know, and you have mm-hmm. a small glimpse into it. Yeah. 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 And listen, I was really proud of my mom when I told her I was starting this podcast and I was like, you're not going to like the title. It's birds and bees don't fuck. And because it's true. And she's like, no, no, I like, I think that's funny. She's like, no, cl- yeah. <laughs> the woman who tells us like that we sound like truckers when we curse all the time. And, and then it's like all, all of her children and my sister's ch- children are like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> I grew up cursing like a sailor. Oh my me, my, 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 I feel like I had a friend who was like around me and my mom. And she was like, I swear more after hanging out with you and your mom. I love that. That's hilarious. How were they growing up? Like in terms of, because you went to a Catholic school, like a Catholic girl yeah. school. So what was it like at home? I mean, I feel like, because my, my parents were both like immigrants. We were, you know, my mm. mom's from Guyana. My dad's from the Philippines. And I don't think we ever really like talked about any stuff, you mm-hmm. know, but I don't think it's like my mom would have like denied me. Like if I had asked a question, I think she would answer. Like I remember one time we were driving and there was a song and I was like, it was talking about like a pimp. I'm like, what's a pimp? Oh. And then she didn't answer me truthfully. Yeah. You know what I mean? She's like, okay, well, there, and and so I feel like my at home, I don't remember that. I feel like my dad's probably a lot more like Catholic. Mm. You know what I mean? A little more like um, monosyllabic, not t- talking about anything, not talking about feelings, definitely not talking about sex. Yeah. I cannot imagine. I feel like I introduced, also recently introduced my dad to my girlfriend. And then my mom told me later on that she, he was like, when is she going to get a boyfriend? Oh. And she's like, that's her girlfriend. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like with my dad, it's kind of like, we just don't talk about it but I feel like with my mom like my mom she's a lot more open like she took me to a gay bar when I was like 14 she snuck me in just mostly because it was like my uncle and her were going out with my uncle who's gay my gunkle um gunkle, I love that and they were just like you we're not gonna just leave you in the hotel room alone you're gonna have to come with you gotta us come so hang they, out yes yeah, so <laughs> I remember she dressed me she put like a lot of makeup on and she's like we're just gonna sandwich you in so it's gonna be me you ah. your uncle would just go fuck fast <laughs> and i got in um just usher just yeah usher. <laughs> and so i feel like my mom was never like buttoned up or, or not buttoned up but like not closed off about that stuff but yeah. she if i had asked i think she would have answered but i just don't think i ever was like let me ask my mom about my sex life mm-hmm. i think because of like the catholic thing it really yeah. was did put like a lot of shame in me you know like i also think that like I have a gay brother. I have a lot of gay family members or queer family members. I didn't realize I was like queer till like a few years ago. And I think it's truly because of my Catholic upbringing. Yeah. Because my family, my mom worked in the AIDS and oncology war. And I have like, you know what I mean? I had a lot of exposure to to the queer community. And so I always think about like the amount of like internalized homophobia I must have had because of it. I remember them like showing us like, um, like information or like articles from like the Catholic times about like why gay marriage is bad or things like that. You know what I mean? And so I feel like my family was pretty, my mom at least was pretty open. My dad, not so much. Definitely. I also went through a weird phase where I was really religious and I would like ask my family to go to church and then pray every single night. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. And how old were you when that that was like about. 13 so like i feel oh, like the height of like when you know you probably start getting horny i started getting like biblical i don't know it's yeah. really like reading the bible every night wow that's so interesting so maybe that's where your beatles energy went into it went into jesus yeah but i mean i also think about the fact that i'm like maybe that was like because i also th- i always think about like nuns i'm like mm-hmm. i wanted to be a nun for a while wow. and i wonder my entire theory about like nuns especially from old time is just like queer women who didn't want to get married probably. yeah yeah so i'm like i wonder if there was a part of me that like not recognize that but like related to that i don't know but i also feel like i was like i don't want to be a nun because i want to like bo- because boys yeah so yeah the boys part of the bi part yeah <laughs> but yeah i mean i could definitely see that as an avenue because you see these women who are not bothered by men or their yeah. lives are not I mean they're ran by men because of the priests yeah. but like 
they have that se separation. So I can see it as a queer kid that you'd be like, well, I don't really see queer options available to yeah. me, but this seems chill. Yeah, like, absolutely. All right. If I get left alone, that's <laughs> great because a little poke poke can be annoying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's so interesting. When I was 13, I was the exact opposite. Like I did grow up in a really religious home, but I, I'm also first generation. So okay, like yeah. there's definitely... I mean, everybody has guilt and shame and all that stuff. And my parents are also from two different countries. So mm -hmm. my mom is from Scotland, although she mostly grew up in New York. But mm -hmm. like my grandfather was Polish and my grandmother was Scottish. So mm -hmm. like, you know, we are, <laughs> we're like all over the world. We're just taking over the world. Um, and then my dad is from Israel. And so my dad is similar to yours. Mm -hmm. Like even, he, he's, so he's an Aries too. I I'm an Aries. Yeah, oh my God, okay. yay. Are you also an Aries? I'm I was a gonna, Leo. I'm oh, a Leo. I was gonna ask earlier when you were you were talking about something. I was like, this seems like fire sign energy. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. <laughs> you're like, oh yeah, I pursued him. Yeah. So you're gonna, yeah, exactly. So you're gonna appreciate this. So my whole my car being totaled and whatever. And so like when when I got the call, like of course, like I called my parents just yeah. to like update them. And I'm like crying about this car because I love my car. And I was like, I'm like, no, it's not the time. And I'm also missing a tooth. And I was like, and I also <laughs> don't have a tooth. And I gotta buy this tooth. And the whole industry is right now it was a low point i was very sad <laughs> i was going through all the things and my aries dad is like yelling at me that everything <laughs> is okay and it's fine and they'll help me and it's fine and i'm getting insurance and i'm gonna have a tooth he's like we're like yelling back and forth i'm like i don't have a tooth he's like we're gonna make sure you have a tooth i'm like you don't have to it's fine you do too much and he's like no it's fine i'm gonna make sure you have a tooth i'm not gonna have a tooth like, what are these people but all of that is to say that like foreign dads sometimes don't know how to take on sadness. I can see. Yeah. 100%. They don't know how to hold space for that. And my yeah. mom too, like they were just both like, we don't want you to ever be sad, sad. ever. <laughs> we came to this country for you to be happy. <laughs> it's like, yes, this country sucks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're in a, with the worst, I mean, I'm it's, one of the ba a bad timeline. It's a bad time. Like our, oh, but this is what I was going to say about Gen X, like, or not X, Z, Z whatever the fuck yeah. letter it is, the younger <laughs> ones. Uh, uh. Um, if you think about the way that they've grown up and how old they were when Me Too happened. Oh, yeah. So much of their life has been about the revelations around sexual abuse and mm. sexual harassment and abuses of power and coercion and inequities and all of that stuff, besides all of the other trauma that's been yeah. happening since pretty much, you know, 2008, um, which most of them were like babies or just being born at that time. Yeah. And so if you really look at their life timeline and how old they were in their formative education, their formative education was around that same time. Wow, so it's kind of no yeah. surprise that they're like, let's not touch. Also, they grew up completely in the digital age with Snapchat and this yeah. and that, and they can have the safety of the screen. So it is yeah. really interesting to see the psychology of different people as they grow up in different times. And like coercion, like the whole like yawn and stretch thing, like that was considered like so smooth for us yeah. growing up. But now we look at that and it's like, get the fuck out of here yeah. with that. Did like, you if, ask her? Did yeah. she consent to that? Yeah. Like, like if yeah. you want to touch me, you can ask me. And by the way, it's super fucking hot when you do. Like, holy <laughs> shit. It's so sexy when someone is like, can I kiss your lips? Like, whichever ones. Yeah. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it, so it is really interesting because even our generation, I think can be uncomfortable when somebody first, like when you're first with a partner who asks you, yeah. can I kiss you? That's an uncomfortable thing because we've never had it done before. Yeah. So it's like these generational things and shifts. Absolutely. I also think that like, what was I just going to say? Oh my God. I'd like, I thought, what was it? I'm going to, Wow. It's going to come back to you. It's going to come back to me. Recording. I know, right? No, I'm going to, I'm going to, well, yeah. maybe I'll, it's time for a pop quiz. Woo! Okay. How do I want to ask you this? Um, I'll ask you the definition of, oh boy. What is the frenulum? <laughs> oh man. Um, it's the front part. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 That's, I that's, feel like it's I like I said horrible sex education. Even though I've been in sex education, um, literally the star like, literally, of the show. 
I th- say say the word. Can you use the word in a sentence? <laughs> the frenulum is an extremely sensitive part of the body. I'm gonna go around or like a fr- I, uh, uh, front, front front. Front. It is on the front part near of the body. The clit ish. It is clit not. Adjacent? It is. Uh, it is not. I mean, I guess you could consider that, but it is not on bodies that have vulvas. Wow. So it is a part of the penis. <laughs> oh, is it right underneath? Is the little connector thingy right? Yeah. Under, underneath what part? The penis. The penis taint. No. Of the, of the foreskin. Yes. 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 yes, yes okay. Yes. Okay. okay. So. Wow. We've got our Woo! guy. Which I feel like when Allison Goldberg was on here, maybe we named him, but I don't know. Fred. He's going to be Fred today. Right. I looked at the wrong camera. <laughs> Is that sign helping, by the way? The pardon? The what? No, no, the little look up sign. I, I feel like I am forgetting, yeah. but still, because I'm like, look at my thought. Yeah. Here's behind the scenes, yeah. everyone. Okay, so here's our little friend, Fred. Uh, and so the frenulum connects the foreskin to the head of the penis. So when there is foreskin, if it's not been circumcised, then, you know, obviously you have to pull it down a little bit for circumcised Mm -hmm. penises. It's pretty much just right there. Um, so the frenulum is, uh, the V shape right here. So it's just under the head where it connects all of the skin. And it's a very, very sensitive area of the penis. So something that you can do if you like to play with penises is put a lot of lube, not spit, use lube. And just like massage this little area and it feels really nice. Oh, <laughs> I can't believe how wrong I initially was. And also you saying that reminded me how much sex ed came from like Cosmo. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, 10 ways to give a better blow job. Like everything. And, and that's the thing too, with Cosmo and all of those magazines, all jobs. it was all about blow jobs. About him. Yeah, Ten ways to please your him. man. Mm-hmm. I remember mm-hmm. one of the tips was hold his balls like a little baby bird, which is nice. Little, Very nice, little baby bird. Yeah, don't forget about the balls. They're, <laughs> they need love too. Um, oh God, there was something else I was going to say. I don't remember. Um, anyway, I passed it off to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's my podcast, and I have to think about things to say. Imagine that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's like. Those all of those articles from back in the day were so fucking dumb. Like, oh my god, we the messages that we received were so all about coercion, being smooth and sexy, and like that's that's what like you know the smooth guys had was like you know coercion and everything you know their pleasure was our responsibility yeah. and you know there was never any it was never pleasure forward yeah at least not for people with bolas but i do think it is like watching gen z re- re- um react to like even like the in like in the notebook where they're like he's coercing her he's a mission and he's manipulating her by hanging on this ferris wheel we're like we're, we're like this is so romantic like yeah this is our idea of rom- romance when we were growing up like half of it was coercion a hundred percent and it's interesting i so i posted on my stories uh yesterday what does romance mean to you because i started thinking and i posted a video about this like what if we started to see romance as a kink instead of an expectation yeah hundred percent. when you're kinky you know what you want you explore it you're like okay what is the feeling that i'm trying to get how do i achieve that how can i communicate that to my partner like my partner is going to be like yes i can do that no i can't how about we do like there's negotiation there's talking expectations are set there's feedback there's all this stuff but when it comes to romance it's just like he never buys me flowers anymore she never plans any dates it's all on me and like well it's like okay everyone's fucking nagging yeah everyone's just nagging no one's communicating how does like if you're just telling him you never buy me flowers you never buy me flowers you never like why is somebody possibly going to buy you flowers if you're just nagging about it yeah but if you instead phrase it like hey when I receive flowers from you, it makes me feel so fucking good. And that turns me on. That yeah. makes me more attracted to you. So now it actually is a kink because it's facilitating that sexual experience and that arousal because ultimately the romance does feed into the arousal. It's all yeah. the eroticism. It's all sex, y'all. It's all sex, all the <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's true. It all like plays a part. And I feel like men sometimes, not all men, but I feel like it is one of those things where it's like we do need to communicate with 
if you're dating a man that you you need to kind of like let him know and clue him yeah. in, I feel like. And share the why. Yeah. Like I want you to get me flowers because this is what happens when you do. Yeah. Or I would like you to plan a date once a month because when you do, this is how it makes me feel. And when I feel this way, I'm more open and receptive to you. <laughs> and then I I am going to be more ready to have a sexual experience with you. And I am going to be more turned on. And guess what? The sex is going to be better. It's Hell all yeah. it's all connected. Yeah. But it's all communication. A hundred percent. Everything is communication. That's my big th- thing when they talk about in inter- job interviews. I'm like, I'm good at communicating. Communication is key. It's yeah. It's true though. It's true. And that yeah. is when when you're working with couples, like that is the thing that is missing the most. Or even when I work with individuals too, yeah. they'll be like, well, I said it to so-and-so. And I'm like, okay, but let's explore how you said it. Let's explore when you said it. Yeah. What where what part of the house did you have this conversation in? What what time of day was it? How were you feeling before the conversation? What what was your partner's day like? Like yeah. all of these things factor into the success rate of your communication. Yeah. So Good time to say I have a yes, no, maybe list and a class for that. So it'll help you with your sexual communication. Go to birdsandpeacedontfuck.com. Hell yeah. Uh, but where can people find you? They can find me on Instagram. Um, and I have a website, christinemadrano.com. Chrissy Meds is my Instagram. I was banned from Twitter <laughs> on January 6, 2020. Wow. And then just couldn't – then when Elon took over, I'm like, I don't want to come guy. back. I don't want to come guy. back. Yeah, fuck him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I want to know that story before we go. <laughs> <laughs> I was just screaming at Republicans being, I think I, I, think I called um, Tommy Loren a cunt or something. I love that. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Power to the people. Yeah. You've done, you've done a service to this country. <laughs> I know it was just truly like, like every right. It was like January sixth. Was like what a while. That shit was fucking wild. That I was-, was on a meeting, and all of us slowly. And the meeting that I was on was with uh, legal and labor. No, labor wasn't. On, I don't think labor was on that call, but it was legal, medical, safety, production executives, HR. Like it was like top, top, top people. Yeah, and we were like, what the. F- what the fuck is actually happening right now? Oh so like we all had yeah. our, we were, we stayed on the zoom as everything, as like they were progressing into the building, we were all on zoom together and we were like, uh, what the fuck is happening? I truly, I, truly I, that shit was so fucking wild. That's why I was like, I was tweeting away. I was like, rah, 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 cause I couldn't, it, you, I felt helpless. You couldn't really do anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're just like watching what an possibly a thing. Dem- democracy fall. Right? I don't know. Like, it's like a wild. It was like our entire, our entire life is trauma, but it's like the <laughs> shit that we have seen, which goes back to, to Gen X too. And like, that's like what their little baby years had, at least in yeah. our little baby years, it was just, you know, you're one of the coercion um (laughs) but like oh boy okay let's not end on trauma um Um, let's what can we say that's fun oh um i uh cut the your wait i can't get it off your i I do want to point out that her cat brought her an avocado (laughs) (laughs) i've never been more impressed with a cat especially in california (laughs) avocados are expensive to be fair it's it's kind of dead i'm gonna show the people the avocado so if you're just listening on uh, the podcast and start watching on YouTube, it's way more fun when you watch on YouTube because you get to see Frank or Fred or what did they name this guy? I don't know. I think it was Fre- Fred, frankly. And- I don't know. If you have a name to submit for this uh, confetti dildo, please email me at birdsandbeesdontfuck.com. I mean, at gmail.com. I don't know. Just go to my website, y'all. All right. Here's the avocado. Here's the avocado. We are going to end on the avocado. Cat avocado. Cat avocado. Uh, thank you for being here. If you like this podcast, please do uh, like, subscribe, tell a friend, send it to a friend. Uh, follow me on Instagram, birds and bees don't fuck. My website has uh, coaching and classes and all the shit to give you the education that none of us got. Uh, so visit over there, birds and bees don't fuck.com. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And that's it. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.